Happy President's Day. No sport is more closely aligned to the American presidency than baseball. I'm going to tell you about the bond between the office and the sport, as well as the time an American president saved the game of baseball. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked On MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, baseball writer for Sports Illustrated. Thank you for making us your first listen every single day. And today's episode brought to you by our friends at Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online is where the game starts. And on President's Day, like I said, you can't talk about the presidency without talking about baseball. And specifically, there's a couple presidents that stand out when you look at the interactions between the president and baseball. So first, I want to tell you about the, the history of the first pitch being from the president. The year is 1910. And baseball's in this stretch where uh, the lure of the diamond seems to be on the decline, especially in Washington, D.C. The Washington Senators are not very good. And so Washington owner Clark Griffith has this idea. He's like, if I can get the president of the United States to come to a baseball game, not only just to show up in the stands, but to take time away from the pressing needs of the nation to throw out a first pitch, then certainly like that would tell the average person that, yes, spending nine innings over the summer in the ballpark is worth your time. And that's something that had been hard to do. They asked President Grover Cleveland to come to a game, and he said, quote, What do you imagine the American people would think of me if I wasted my time going to the ballgame? President William McKinley was asked to throw out a first pitch at the opener between Washington and Brooklyn, and they did all of the work. They, they built the presidential box, members of Congress came, and he just never showed up. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt got a gold season pass issued by uh, the president of the National Association of Professional Baseball Leagues that got him free admission to any baseball game, and he never used it. But Clark Griffith was a little bit different. So he was the owner of the Washington Senators, but he knew, he, he socialized a lot inside of Washington. And so he knew uh, members of Congress, the Supreme Court, members of the administration, and William Taft was a like genuinely a sports fan. And so he usually played golf, but he really enjoyed baseball. And him and James Sherman, the vice president, had actually gone to a game in 1909 between the Red Sox um, and the Nationals and, and kept score themselves. The first time since like 1892 that a president had gone to a game. Uh, they stayed for the whole game. And so by 1910, that was one of those things where Taft was kind of, uh, he, he needed a respite, let's put it that way, from the things going on in Washington. And so he was invited to the April 14th season opener. Uh, perfect spring day, 12,226 fans came to the game, a record for the Washington Senators. And they asked Walter Johnson, the starting pitcher, they said, will you by chance throw out the first pitch? And uh, he said, yeah, no, not happening. Uh, that is that is not my job. I am not doing that. And so they told the designated catcher, Gabby Street, he was going to do it instead. Well, the president comes uh, with Mrs. Taft and a whole party. I mean, they bring the vice president. They bring the secretary of the Senate. They bring all these people. And Taft had just left a uh, speech to a conference of suffragettes and had uh, been booed by them. So he needed the positive vibes. And so... Um, so what Gabby Street did was Gabby Street went to him and 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 said, "Hey, throw the like throw me the first pitch. Do this for me." The catcher did this. Nobody realized this. They hadn't actually asked him to throw out the first pitch. They just asked him to come to the game. So Gabby Street goes up to him himself and says, "Hey, give me the first pitch." So President Taft walks out there, his wife's holding the baseball, he walks out there, he throws his gloves off, and keep in mind, 
William Taft's a 300-pound man. Big guy. Throws it. Not a strike. But he catches it. It gets there in the air. And the crowd roars. The crowd absolutely loves it. People are are going wild. People are going crazy. And they stayed for the whole game. And what's funny is, and think about how this would work now. Uh, Frank Baker of the A's hits a line drive foul ball into the president's box. And it balances off the Secretary of State's head. Okay? Um, but they stayed because Walter Johnson had a no-hitter going into the seventh inning. Um, it turns out that the no-hitter was broken up um, because right-footer Doc Gessler was running back for a fly ball and collides with a fan. So a little bit of a different time. Ball falls for a ground rule double. But the next day, the, all of the stories in the sports pages across the country is that President Taft came to the game. And the descriptions were glowing descriptions. Uh, one of the newspapers said, quote, he did it with his good trusty right arm and the virgin spear scudded across the diamond, true as a die to the pitcher's box. And, and it was something where it, it, it humanized the presidency. I mean, he was there with a bag of peanuts and a ball game. And so after that, uh, the, the next day, William Taft gets that ball at the White House, and he actually has a request for an autograph of the ball from the pitcher, from Walter Johnson. Little, little, um, kind of, uh, little reversal of roles there. But that's something where that was the first time where the president had thrown out the fit, the first pitch. And Walter Johnson actually goes on to keep a collection of ceremonial first pitch baseballs autographed by U.S. presidents. But all of the positive press made Taft feel good. And so like a month later, he gives a speech. And he says, I like baseball for two reasons. One, because I enjoy it. And two, because if the presence of the temporary chief magistrate, talking about himself being the president and not being a permanent position, um, such a healthy amusement can be encouraged, I want to encourage it. He, so he attends another baseball game a few days later. Shares a bag of peanuts with the vice president. Uh, and Boston beats the Senators. Uh, did it again in 1911. Threw out the first pitch there. Was going to do it in 1912, but the Titanic disaster had happened a few days before, and they thought it would look kind of awkward for him to go ahead and throw out another first pitch. So they invited him to come back in June, and Congress actually adjourned early for the day, and all of Congress goes to the game to watch him throw the first pitch, this time to Walter Johnson. And so this is something where, like, this is kind of seen as the turning point that that kept baseball going um, because he went and he did that first pitch. And it's something where, where, obviously, I mean, he's a big guy. It takes a lot for him to get it there. And I do want to tell you in just a minute about how a president may have actually swayed an entire World Series. Uh, but first, I want to think about our friends at Built Bar. Built Bars are... The best protein bars in the market. 100% real chocolate, uh, full of protein, low calorie. Most of the bars are like 130 calories, 17 grams of protein. They also have puffs, protein infused marshmallows. As far as I know, first time that's ever happened. So, yeah, not just a protein bar, it's a treat. Like I said, everything's covered in 100% real chocolate. So go online to built.com, check out the flavors that they have uh, for the bars mint brownie. Peanut butter brownie, coconut almond, white chocolate cookies and cream's a good one. Like a lot of flavors, and they have some recurring ones that pop up every now and then for a short limited time and go away, like Rocky Road. And then the puffs, churro, coconut marshmallow, banana cream pie, things like that. So go to built.com, check out the list of everything that's there. While you're there, use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off your order. That's promo code LOCKED15 at built.com. And Today's episode also brought to you by our friends at Rock Auto. And the thing about Rock Auto is there's so many types and varieties of cars out there. And with these cars, there's so many additional parts. And it's almost impossible for your local auto parts store to keep everything in stock. You know, they're going to ask you whether your car is an LX or an EX or a Sport or not a Sport. And then they're going to tell you, we don't have the part. We have to ship it from a warehouse. Well, instead of doing that, go 
see our friends at Rock Auto. So rockauto.com, uh, it's a family-owned business. It's been serving DIYers for over 20 years, but their prices are reliably low. Uh, sometimes it's 30 or 50 or even 100% cheaper than buying it from a chain store or a car dealership. They have everything you could need. I mean, from like brake parts, uh, tail lamps, motor oil, all the way to even, I mean, the carpets for your car. So go to rockauto.com right now, see all the parts available for your car or truck, right locked on in the how did you hear about us box so they know that we sent you. Uh, amazing selection, reliable low prices, and all the parts your car will ever need at rockauto.com. I want to tell you about how the president may have swayed the 1924 World Series. So we're, t- we're talking now about President Calvin Coolidge. So he's a guy, really interestingly, did not have to ever really have a lot of political opposition. So he started off in Massachusetts state politics and eventually became governor of Massachusetts. And in 1919, his response to the Boston police strike was seen as a real um, like decisive action that he took to take care of the strike. And so the next year, he is Warren G. Harding's vice president. So he gets election in 1920. Warren Harding dies in 1923, dies in office. And so Calvin Coolidge becomes the president. In 1924, he runs for election, wins election, uh, and is now the president. But he's he's always been known as a guy who said very little, kind of had a dry sense of humor. And so the nickname he got was Silent Cow. He's been called Silent Cow for that. Um, and, and so it's something where his public perception isn't necessarily great. And to go along with this, you'll remember from the previous thing, uh, the Washington Senators is a local team. Well, the Washington Senators have been bad. They have been bad for a long time. And so something that they're trying to work on, they want to work on getting, getting better, and they're trying to compete. He wants to work on his public image, and he remembers how people responded to William Taft going to baseball games. You know, the the positive newspaper stories, the positive press and things like that. What helps this whole thing is his wife, Grace. Grace is a huge sports fan. Loves the Washington Senators. At one point, Bucky Harris, the manager of the Washington Senators, says she is, quote, the most rabid baseball fan I have ever known to occupy the White House. And so Grace wants to drag Calvin to the ballpark. And the thing about Calvin is he's known as Silent Cal, but he's also known for his luck. He's called it's called Coolidge luck. He's known for being a guy who who it seems to always work out for him whether politics or otherwise. Very very lucky. And so they successfully convince him in 1924 to come opening day, April 15th, and throw out the first pitch. Well, he does. It's a strike, in case you were curious. And Walter Johnson, pitcher for the Senators, you remember him from the last segment, Walter Johnson goes on to throw a shutout. And the Washington Senators have always been bad, but this season, they are not. Calvin Coolidge continues to come to games, dragged there by his wife, Grace. They come to all of the big games, so they they regularly show up in the press during the summer months, and it's always positive press. They're just like the rest of us. They're sitting there with their peanuts and their pop or whatever they served back in the 20s at a baseball game. I don't actually know. Um... You know, they're they're seen as human, they're seen as relatable and all of that. And so so they continue to attend. Well, Washington continues to win. The Washington Senators go on to win the pennant and they're going to the World Series. So a um, little bit harder now in October of 1924 to try to make the World Series. I'm sorry, to try to show up to the World Series for Calvin Coolidge. He makes it to Game 1. He goes to Game 1 of the 24 World Series um, to throw out the first pitch. They lose close on a controversial call. Okay. He can't go to Game 2 because of his religion. He can't attend sports on Sundays. 
Games three through five are away. Game six and game seven are going to be at home. Now, when they get back to Washington, they are down to the Giants three to two. Things look not great for the Washington Senators. President Calvin Coolidge makes a point to get there early to game six. Goes, speaks to the team. Has Grace right there with him. They sit in the box. Washington wins two to one. He says, okay, I'm coming back for game seven. He comes back for game seven. I believe this is Saturday. uh, Saturday the 10th. He comes back for game seven. Game seven is tied in the ninth. He needs to leave because they're getting, but his wife won't let him. Grace will not let him leave. He stays. It goes all the way to the 12th where the Senators walk it off and win the World Series. The the Coolidge luck by throwing out the first pitch of the first game that season of the season opener, the Coolidge luck rubbed off on the Senators. It's the only World Series, to my knowledge, that they won in, um, in Washington. Walter Johnson's the MVP of the American League. Um, he actually gets, he actually goes to that game next the next year to give him the MVP award, as well as the recognize the World Series champions. Uh, they do make it back to the 1925 World Series. I believe they lost that World Series. I want to say that was that was Pittsburgh. Yes, yeah, yeah, because the Pirates. Um, were down 3-1, and they rallied to win. Uh, so, first time that had ever happened. But Calvin Coolidge goes on after this to win re-election and become the first president, at the time, the first president to serve more than two terms because he had his two terms, and he had the beginning where he filled in the last year of Warren Harding's term. So, the Coolidge luck absolutely worked. And in just a minute, I want to tell you about how a president may have saved the game of baseball. Uh, But first, our friends at BetOnline want you to know that football is over for the season, but basketball is in full steam, both pro and college hoops. And whether it's the latest odds, totals, player performance props, all the way to where the next fired coach is going to go, BetOnline.net is your number one spot for all your sports betting needs. It's not just basketball. BetOnline.net is your source for hockey, boxing, UFC, all the way up to and through the Olympics. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action because Bet Online is where the game starts. Okay, so FDR saved baseball. Back in World War I in 1918, uh, baseball wanted to keep playing and General Enoch Crowder issued a worker fight order, which said men in non-essential occupations, and they declared baseball was non-essential, had to either get a war-related job or be drafted in the military. So the 1918 season did not finish. They they stopped the season September 2nd to enter the military. Well, now it's 1942. Uh, It's a month after Pearl Harbor, so it's January. And the owners don't know whether or not they should plan for a season. There is money you have to spend to get ready for the season. And their question is, are we going to be allowed to play? We are in war. So they asked Commissioner Kennesaw Landis to try to figure out, are we going to be allowed to play or not? And so Kennesaw Landis on January 14th, 1942, writes a handwritten letter to the White House asking for advice from the president. Uh, among other things, he says, quote, the time is approaching when, in ordinary conditions, our teams would be heading to spring training camps. However, in, in as much as these are not ordinary times, I venture to ask what you have in mind as to whether professional baseball should continue to operate. And President Roosevelt actually responds the very next day, which is surprising because uh, President Roosevelt and Kennesaw Landis were separate political parties and the distaste between the two men was publicly known. Like it was, it was known that 
Landis did not like Roosevelt, and Roosevelt did not care for Landis too much. But Roosevelt writes the very next day, and they they later named this the Green Light Letter. But he says, among other things, I honestly feel that it would be best for the country to keep baseball going. He says that baseball is something that can be a source of relax of relaxation and um, distraction for American workers because right now their hard work and their well-being is paramount because that's going to be essential to victory. And he says, quote, baseball provides a recreation which does not last over two hours or two hours and a half and which can be got for very little cost. And incidentally, I hope that night games can be extended because it gives an opportunity to the day shift to see a game occasionally. Well, one, baseball takes a lot longer now and costs a lot more, but the point is baseball provides a recreation which helps people... um, you know, relax, get their mind off a hard day at work. Roosevelt continues and says that the value of baseball was its ability to benefit so many while requiring so few resources. And so they said, well, if 300 teams between major and minor league teams use a total of 5,000 players, these players are a recreational asset to 20 million of their fellow, of their fellow citizens. Quote, and that, in my judgment, is totally worthwhile. He made it clear that like, while he wished for baseball to continue, he would not exempt players from military service if they were eligible. And he said like, that he was aware that baseball's popularity could possibly diminish if star players left to serve overseas. But he said, quote, even if the actual quality of the teams is lowered by greater use of older players, this will not dampen the popularity of the sport. Now, Roosevelt did emphasize this was his personal opinion the official decision was left to Kennesaw Landis and the club owners. But the green light letter was published on front page news all over the entire country. country. And the headline said things like, stay in there and pitch, FDR. Or president says U.S. needs its baseball. And so I'm sure you can imagine the owners breathe a sigh of relief. Um, Clark Griffith, president of the Washington Senators at the time, said, quote, baseball feels highly honored that Mr. Roosevelt has chosen to regard our game as such a vital asset to popular morale. And uh, Larry McHale of the Dodgers, the Brooklyn Dodgers, said, quote, President Roosevelt's letter has clarified the entire baseball picture. The needs of the government are paramount, but I believe baseball can contribute a lot in these times. So in the months and years that followed, there were a lot of people that kind of talked about um, a President Roosevelt night should be a thing that they should do to to raise money for organizations. And over the next four years, you saw the National Association of Minor Leagues and then other teams start to organize President Roosevelt nights at different ballparks. And the reasoning was... um, because that, but for his support, encouragement, and active espousal of the game in Washington, professional baseball would have been shut down as early as the immediate aftermath of Pearl Harbor. Without Franklin Roosevelt, you would have had no baseball these past four seasons. Now, the interesting thing is um, a lot of major leaguers joined the armed services. So like Hall of Famer Bob Feller went to combat. In the middle of his career, went to combat and then came back. A lot of other guys were assigned non-combat duties and they were able to actually play on military baseball teams at bases and things like that. But in their absence, the rosters became really interesting. Um, The Southern Association in 1944, the MVP was Pete Gray, uh, an outfielder with one arm who bat 333. Um, Many veterans came back or a lot of younger players came back. Uh, Cincinnati Reds had a 15-year-old pitcher, Joe Nuxhall. Um, But... This did not let that like they did not choose to to integrate. So like Satchel Page still played in the Negro Leagues and things like that. And it's it's funny how some things work. The St. Louis Browns, another one of those teams like the Senators who had lost a lot, uh, went to the 1944 World Series, uh, the, their only appearance in franchise history. Um, the Cubs won the 1945 National League pennant, and that's where you got the whole curse of the Billy Goat thing, where it took them so long to get you know to get back. Uh, Game four of the 1945 World Series was where the whole curse of the Billy Goat thing um, started. So we almost didn't have baseball without FDR saying it was allowed to continue. I can't imagine baseball going away for four years and then trying to come back after the war. Uh, But the green light letter, 
allowed baseball executives to continue the game. It give, gave millions of Americans a recreational outlet and then gave thousands of others a chance to um, take the field and serve their country with a bat and ball instead of a rifle. The actual original letter is in the archives at the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. So if you ever have a chance to go to Cooperstown, New York, you can check out and read the original letter from FDR. I want to thank you for another great episode of Locked on MLB Prospects. If you stay tuned this week, we have a lot of fun stuff coming up. We're previewing college baseball with the ACC on Tuesday. We're talking to our friends from Locked on Phillies. We're talking catchers for our deep dive we do on Wednesday. And we've got another Farm Friday on Friday. If you have questions for the show, I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. The show's on Twitter at Locked on Farm. You can email us at LockedOnMLBProspects at gmail.com. And I'll get to your questions on next Monday's mailbag. If you're watching on YouTube, thank you. We really, we really do appreciate it. Please do us a favor and like and subscribe. It really does help the show a ton. Until next time, this has been Locked on MLB Prospects.